Let's make ready to hear God's word this morning in the sermon as we stand to read our scripture. It's on the screen today. Let's grab our Bibles and open up the word of God uh, that we may read clearly and boldly and confidently um, the, ser- the, the word of God for the sermon uh, this morning. Uh, the book of Genesis, uh, the 45th chapter, and I will be bringing you part two of a sermon I began last Lord's Day morning. So, The book of Genesis, the 45th chapter, beginning at verse 1. I will read to verse 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land in these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to, pr- to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, and your flock, and your herds, and all that you have. There I, have, there I will also provide for you. For there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you have um, would be impoverished. Behold your, eyes, behold, your eyes see, the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father all of my splendor in Egypt and all that you've seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck, and he kissed his brothers and, they, and, and wept on them. And afterward, his brothers talked to them. Uh, this is the reading of God's word. It's inspired, infallible, immutable, uh, inerrant uh, word uh, for the sermon, and the church said, Amen. You may be seated. I'm not going to spend time this morning recollecting last week. If you missed it, you have missed something tremendously important for you. I will, by way of a small recap, as a springboard into this morning, uh, talk to you on the matter of forgiveness. And as you heard me speak last week, I struggled on how to title the sermon. And the sermon title came out of my own conviction. The sermon title came out of my own understanding of where I am in my Christian life. The sermon title came out of my own conflicts and trials and struggles in my own life on the matter of forgiveness. Hence it is titled, you can see on the screen, Do I Understand Forgiveness? It is a question I had to ask myself, having been a father to my children, a husband to my wife, a pastor to a church, and brothers to brothers, and brothers to, as a brother to sisters, as a mentor of many, as an encouragement of so many people, do I understand forgiveness myself? And I had to come to terms with some things in my own life. And hence I presented the title, Do I Understand Forgiveness? And I do hope this morning in part two, that you would, even if you've missed out on part one, be able to grasp the enormity of the the great truth here concerning forgiveness. This is a matter of the theology of forgiveness. It's not a sermon that we just get by and say, oh, that was a good sermon, uh, as people usually say. But something that's so worked in our hearts that every one of us today, there's not a person to be excluded. Every one of us falls into this, into this category of answering this question, do I understand forgiveness? It's not about the person next to you who understands or the person behind you or in front of you who understands. The question is, do you personally understand forgiveness? And I hope in part two uh, to, to bring to a close where I left off last week uh, from part one. The sermon, like I said, has been birthed out of real troubles. In case any of you 
will say to me either at the end of this service, well, nobody said to me at the end of last week's service, but if somebody might write to me or say to me, somebody watching by way of the video broadcast from the other end of the world may write to me and say, well, that's good for you to speak about. You don't know what we've been through. You don't know about my personal situation. You don't know about my hurt and pain. You don't know how I was abused. You don't know the, 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 the sorrow that's been caused to my own life or my marriage or my family or my church. You don't know those things. How is it that you can say we, we must forgive? Or how is it that we're supposed to understand this forgiveness when you don't know what we've been through? And the, the hurt is still there. The wounds are still raw. We can, we can, we can, every time something happens, it triggers some sort of emotion in us that takes us down the route of hurt and pain. How can you identify with us? It's good for you to speak that, but you don't know what we're going through. And that's very often the case that when we're dealing with matters like this, we often come up with this statement. Well, you don't know what I feel, and you don't know what I'm going through. And that's absolutely right. Nobody knows what somebody else is going through. I, in no means as a pastor, will ever try to impose myself and insert myself into your life to know what you're going through. It's irrational to do that. It's unfair to do that. It's unrealistic to do that. And I often say to people, when I say, I, say, I will try to understand what you're going through, but I don't really understand what you're going through. That doesn't mean I'm without knowledge of things. It means that that, that, that experience is unique to your life and only you know what you're going through. I say that to you today, to say that each and every one of us has gone through something, is going through something, and will go through something. There are people that have hurt us in the past, there are people that have hurt you today, and there are people who will hurt you tomorrow. And in every one of those situations, God uses these words, forgive, forgiveness. And like I said, we often cry out, but Lord, you don't know. But Lord, you don't understand. But Lord, you don't know what it feels like. And when someone gathers around you at the coffee place or making tea or sweeping the church property or in a prayer meeting or in a sermon like this or in a Q&A session, you would say, but you don't know what we're going through. You don't know the hurt and pain. Let me tell you something. This, is, this sermon series, this two-part sermon series has been born out of real life experience. That we wanted nothing to do with this man. As a family, we wanted nothing to do with this man. For the hurt and the pain that he's caused us, for the sorrow that he's caused us as a family. He's thrown our family reputation into the gutter. He's ripped our family apart in the sense of the wounds that he's caused. We've never been so angry uh, in our family as we've been in the last few months. Anger at what's been caused. And so we were in the middle of this. I did not want this man back in my home. I didn't want him back at my table. He, he has betrayed the trust of my home. He's betrayed the trust of my family. In my family table, you, don't, you, you have no right to sit at my table. You earn the right to sit at my table. This is how we steward our home. Our children know it is not their right to sit at our table. They have to earn their right to sit at our table, mean, meaning that they have to show respect, they have to show honor, they have to show integrity. We treat each other the way the Bible calls us to treat each other. So you earn your place at the table. And this is how we train men and women in our home, that the place we hold at, at the table is a place that we've earned by showing who we are as Christians and who we are in the family. And here we have a man who's betrayed all of that, he's ripped all of that apart. And not only that, but the ministry itself and the pulpit that we've trusted him with, it ripped all of that apart. Our, our story is known from Glasgow to the ends of Wales. Everyone knows of what's happened now. Our reputation has been ripped apart. All of these things have happened. So out of this has come this. So don't tell me, I don't know, what's, I don't know what, you, what you feel, what you're going through. Or don't, don't ever say to me that you don't understand what we're going through. I, 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 yes, I said, I, I, I really don't understand what you're going through in your own life. But don't negate the fact that, that we don't know what it feels like to be, have hurt and pain. I do. We've struggled with this for months now. And the Lord has been working on our hearts. And the Lord has been kind to us. And out of this came the question, as I looked at, the, as I looked at my situation, as I looked at my family, as I, as I, as I navigate my family through this, through this process, as I lead you through, as a congregation through this process, I began to ask, my question, ask myself the question, do I understand forgiveness? The natural man in me wants nothing to do with the person. And I began to ask myself, do I understand forgiveness? 
And out of this came this sermon. And here we find the best, one of the best examples in the Old Testament. The matter of Joseph and his brothers. The backstory, the context is quick and easy. It, you, you, you know it already if you've been in church long enough. His, his brothers are upset with him. His father favors him. His brothers are upset with him. What do they do? They plan to kill him, to take his life, to go against the law of God and to take away his life. They plan to kill him. One of the brothers steps up and said, let's not kill him. His blood will be upon our hands. But they put him in a pit and they sell him into slavery. They go back and lie to their father about what's happened to their brother. And all through this time, that was about probably when he was about 17 years old. And all through this time, a father thinks that he's lost his son. His son has died. And these brothers who are with their father every day, every day of those somewhat 22 years before they now see Joseph face to face, have never confronted their father and told him the truth. They lied. They were hypocrites. They never told their father the truth. The father's lost his son, he thinks. Brothers are living with this every day of their life, not telling the truth about what happened to their brother. And so God has allowed them now, through this famine, God has allowed them, Joseph is uh, wonderfully wise here, uh, recognizing the sovereignty of God. God has allowed this to happen. God has allowed it to happen so that something may come forth. What's happened to me and my family, God has allowed to happen. So that some things could be learned. So that someone could be saved. So that someone could be brought back on the path of righteousness for his namesake. Whatever it is, God is not without knowledge of that situation. God knows everything. And so we find here that God uses the famine to bring the family now back to Joseph. And Joseph here stands before them. The verses, the chapters before that talks about he's already recognized them. They don't know who he is. He's recognized them. He puts them through a test and all that. That's the previous chapters. You'd be good to go read it. He's come to the point now where he's exposing himself to them, or sorry, revealing himself to them. And he begins here in, in uh, at, at, at chapter 45, and he tells them in verse 3, he makes a statement, then he asks a question. He tells them in verse 3, and then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, that's a statement. And then the question, is my father still alive? And from that is the narrative of how we gain to understand the, the great example of the forgiveness of Joseph for his brothers. Remember, the people that are standing before him, the men that are standing before him, are men that have torn him away from his father. The very fact he says, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? Is his great longing and his yearning to be with his father. These are the men who've ripped him literally, spiritually, emotionally. They've ripped him from his father's love for all these years. They've torn him asunder. And all the time, remember, Joseph is, finds favor, goes into part of his house, and he's been tried and tested all the way. The woman accuses him of, 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 of wanting to rape her, of having a relationship with her. He gets put into prison. God speaks to him in the prison. God gets him to reveal dreams. He gets elevated and promoted from the prison. What I mean to say is that his life has not been a bed of roses. He was sold into slavery. When he was sold into slavery, he wasn't given the best seat on the, on, the, on, the, on the caravan trail. They didn't put him on a luxurious caravan and say, oh, here's a nice leather seat for you. Please sit down and have, I hope you enjoy your journey. Would you like some tea and coffee as, you, as we journey towards selling you now? No. He was a slave. Slaves were tied behind the camels. They were pulled across barren land to be to be put in a marketplace and, and laid on display to be sold as goods to people. All of this is in his mind. He knows all this. They've sold him into slavery. He was shackled at the back of a camel. He was put on display like common goods and sold to people and sold into a house where he had to serve. He, he, he was put into prison. Who's responsible for this? We find that if he comes here before God, uh, sorry, he comes here before his brothers and he recognizes his brothers and his immediate response is, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? 
His brothers could not answer him. The Bible says that they were dismayed at his presence. They're shocked. We thought you were dead. We thought you were, something's happened to you. We're never going to see you again. But also his brothers are not responding because the natural response would be not to send, Joseph sent everyone, all his attendants and servants, he sent them out of his presence. The natural response of Joseph would be, get more guards. Bring more people in. I want these men shackled. I want them to pay the price for what they've done to me. For every year that they ripped me away from my father's love, let them be lashed a hundred times for that. For every, for every moment that they took me away from my father's care, let them, let them be, I, I don't know, forced labor, carry heavy rocks in Egypt, whatever it may be. They need to pay for what they've done. That's our response. That's our natural response. But Joseph teaches us otherwise here. He's a typology of Christ here. You can see that in the picture. The typology of Christ. And so we find his uh, response here to his, his brothers is unique. And so we find here, he says from, uh, from verse 10, I'll, I'll, I'll skip down to, to verse 10. He goes on to talk about what's happened to him there, and he wonderfully brings in the, the great theological truth on the sovereignty of God. But look at, look at verse 10. Look at verse 10, because this is where, this was my problem. This was, this was what was, what was, what was, I'm not going to say bugging me, but, but eating me alive here in my own life. And so it is for somebody here today. And I say this in the context of this, and I said this last week. You're, you're even unable to be close to people who have hurt you. You say, I forgive you, but you don't want to be anywhere close to them. You say, I forgive you, but I don't want you near me. You say, I forgive you, but I'm not going to accept any calls from you. You say, I forgive you, but I'm not going to send you a birthday card. You say, I forgive you, but I don't want you at my family meal or my family birthday or my anniversary or the family gathering. To such a point where, you, you, like I said last week, you're, you're, you're angry still with people who have even died. They're dead. It could be parents who have, been, who have, who have died and they've, they've given you a hard time in life and, and you're still upset and angry with them and you don't want to forgive them. You don't even want their name mentioned. Even if you say, I forgive you, you don't even want their name mentioned in your presence. Listen to how Joseph responds. Listen to how Joseph responds. He says, he says to his brothers, you shall live in the land of Goshen. I'm going to make sure that you live here. You're not going to live in a prison. You're not going to live in isolation. You're not going to pay the price for what you've done. He's bringing them into his care. He says, you shall live in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. Listen, he's not pushing them away. He's bringing them closer. These are the people who've done him great harm. These are his brothers who've lied for just about 22 years and haven't told the truth. Joseph knows all this. And yet he says, you shall be near me. We want to punish those who have harmed us. We want to punish those who have inflicted sorrow upon our souls. We want to punish those who have indeed caused us great sorrow in our lives. And even when we've still said we need to forgive, and some of us say this like this, my friends, and that's why we need to understand, as the sermon title says, do I understand forgiveness? Some of us want to say this. We say, well, okay, the Bible says I need to forgive you, so I'm going to forgive you. See, the Bible says, you know, Jesus says I'm going to do that. I must do that. I'm just going to do it. But I really don't want to do it. In your heart, you really don't want to do it. You really don't want to forgive because, again, of the hurt and the pain that's been caused. We don't want to forgive. And even if we are forced to forgive, like we say, oh, the Bible says I should forgive. I just want to forgive. The fruit of that is you want the person nowhere near you. But look at, look at what Joseph does in verse 10. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. Proximity, close to me. You people who sold me into slavery, you people who made my life a misery for 22 years, you people who kept me away from my father's love, 
for 22 years. You kept me away from the raising of, of, of uh, being raised up under my father's hand. You kept me away from being, having a father who will, by day and night, according to Deuteronomy, teach me the word of God. You've kept me away from that. I had to learn a foreign language in Egypt. I had to be, I had to be exposed to pagan gods for 22 years of my life. I was denied family worship. I was denied worshiping the Lord for all of this time and being in the presence of God's people. You, brothers, you are the ones who did this to me. But yet it says, you shall be near me. You and your children, not just you, but your descendants shall be near me. And everything you own and occupy, he says, you and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. What a valuable lesson here, church. But this is the typology of Christ. This is the picture of our Christ. And Jesus Christ says on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He forgives. And not only does he forgive, he doesn't push us away. And yet he should push us away. What is he saying here? Listen, listen, this is what, this is what we do. We, again, I'm going to go and cover this in two seconds. We say, we forgive you, don't, but don't come anywhere near me. I don't want to get hurt again by you. Correct? Because we're scared we're going to get hurt again. We're scared the person's going to do it again. We're scared they're going to do it over. Oh, you've done this. I'm scared you're going to do it again. You've committed adultery. You've lied to me, whatever it may be. You're going to do it again. I'm scared. So here's what I'm going to do. The Bible says I should forgive you. I'm going to do that. I just about make it over the, the mark by saying I forgive you. So I'm not dishonoring God. But I'm not going to have you anywhere near me because I'm scared you're going to do it again. It's the story of all our lives. But here is your Lord. And here is your God. Joseph being a typology and a picture of Jesus. What does Jesus say? I forgive you. Imagine this right now. Jesus doesn't say to us, I forgive you. Stay away from me. Right now, you and I, Christ should tell us that today. If Christ tells us today, I forgive you, but stay away from me. He's absolutely justified to do it. Why? Because, listen, how many times, even as brother, brother Victor prayed today, he says, he says something like this in his prayer, we, 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 are, we have not worshipped God correctly, or we've disobeyed him, we've, we've, we've dishonored him in the week past. Even right up, up, to, up to the sermon, coming to church this morning, there have been things that we thought about, things that have been said in the car, the way we acted towards our children, the way we come irreverently to God, whatever it may be, we've dishonored God. We've not worshipped him carefully, but carelessly. And we come before the Lord, and, the, and we say when the time of prayers, and we say, uh, 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 forgive us our sins, forgive us our debts. And God says, okay, I forgive you. That's his promise to us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That's the promise of God. You confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. God forgives you. But God does not say, Ah, uh, but you see, last week you said the same thing to me. <laughs> last week you said the very same words. And the week before that, you know what? The very same words. And the weeks before that, you said the very same words. How long are you going to continue making this mistake? So I, God, I'm going to say to you, I don't accept you anymore. I'm going to keep my distance from you. Why? Because if I draw you near, you're hurting me more by what you're doing. Imagine if Christ said that to us today. Because we hurt Christ. We hurt God with our disobedience. The Bible uses this word, we grieve God. We grieve God with our disobedience. We grieve God with our attitudes. We grieve God in our, uh, 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 our willful running away from him, from what he's called us to do. I mean it in the sense of obeying his scriptures. But he doesn't say that to us, does he? Imagine if God told us that today. And he says, I remember what you did last week. And I'm not going to, God's saying, listen, I don't, I don't want to be hurt again. Because you're prone to do this. You might do this again. I really don't trust that you're going to be fine. I really don't trust that you're not going to be better. Oh, sorry, I really don't trust that you're going to be better. I, I'm, too, I'm too hurt right now. So you want me to forgive you? Okay, but just stay away from me. Because if you stay away from me, if you keep your distance from me, I'll protect my heart and I won't be grieved anymore. Imagine if God said that to us today. Friends, 
there'll be no hope for any one of us. Why? Because every one of us needs the forgiveness of God today. Amen indeed. We need his forgiveness. We need him. And we need him so much that we want him to draw near to us. We want him to pull him to us. We want him to embrace us. We want to feel his warm kiss upon our cheek. We want to feel uh, our head upon his bosom as he holds us near him. And that's what he does. He says, I forgive you, and he draws you near. He draws you near. He holds you close to him as a father does his child. He holds you close to him. But look at us, friends. Look at us today in the world. Do we understand forgiveness? We say, yes, we forgive, but stay away from me. We want them to, we want them to be punished for what they've done. Well, listen, I, I, I promised you last week that I'll expand a little bit on this. Um, look, at, look with me at the book of Romans. Keep your bookmark here on um, Genesis 45. And go with me to uh, the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. And it's a, it's a familiar verse to you, but let's just read it because that's what needs to be done. It needs to be read. God's word needs to be read in the hearing of God's people. Uh, in the book of Romans, uh, the 12th chapter, and uh, we're looking at verse 19. And here, the context from verse 9 is Paul saying to the congregation, you need to behave like a Christian. That's the immediate context. Um, how to behave like a Christian. And he says here... Um, in verse 19, it says, uh, never take your own, your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Beloved, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Always remember that. You see, what we're doing on the matter of unforgiveness or forgiveness or people who hurt us, let me just phrase it this way, on the matter of people who hurt us, you see, we want justice done. We want justice done. In our eyes, there must be a certain amount of justice to be done before we write off the debt, before we release them from uh, the punishment that we want to put them through. Justice must be done. And we come along and say to you, but Pastor, uh, we come along, Sister, why are you doing that? Brother, why are you doing that? Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. This man needs to pay the price for what he's done. This woman needs to pay the price for what she's done. And these children need to pay the price for what they've done. And we say, but, but sister, you, the, but the Bible says you went in to forgive. Yes, pastor, I got no problem, I can forgive. But that person needs to pay for what they've done. You see, we want to put them through the punishment that we think they deserve. Again, we come back to Christ. Imagine if Christ said to me today, because of what you've done, I don't trust you anymore. I'm going to continue to punish you for what you've done. None of us would be here this morning. There would be no hope for us. Paul reminds us in the, in the letter uh, to the church here in the book of Romans, vengeance is the Lord. God will deal with it. God will deal with it. Go back quickly. I'm, I'm going to come to Matthew in a, in a moment. Uh, go back quickly again to... Genesis 45, and uh, we pick up again from verse 10, and from verse 11, it says, There I will also provide for you, for there will, be, there will be still five years of famine to come, and you and your household, all that you have will be impoverished. Behold, be, be, behold your eyes see, uh, the, the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father all my splendor in Egypt, and all that you've seen, and you must hurry and, and, and bring my father down here. And then verse, verse 14, was one, again, another text that just, that just broke me, just b b broke me to a million pieces. He says here in verse 14, that he fell on his, brother's, uh, on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. Now you can understand Benjamin. You can understand he's falling on Benjamin's neck. He's the more understanding. He, he's, he's the one that, uh, that Joseph first has a, 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 a witness to. And you can understand that. Oh yeah, I understand he fell on Benjamin's neck and he wept. 
He wouldn't fall on the other brothers, but he does. He says, and he kissed all his other brothers and wept on them also. This is how he embraces them. This is Joseph leading the way. This is Joseph uh, stewarding the family. He's not allowing bitterness to come in the way he he weeps. He misses them. He missed them. He wants that relationship with them again. He wants God to restore them. And he leads the way here. And he says he wept. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. There's fellowship between them. They're talking. They're engaging. There is no, there is, again, you know, we've covered the ground in the last half an hour. You know, there's no Joseph saying, I don't want to talk to you. I want nothing to do with you. Stay away from me. Brings them into a land, not a prison. It brings them into a place of care, not a lack of care. And he brings them into a relationship with him by falling on their neck and crying. And that's the most intimate part of the relationship where men would fall on each other and weep and cry and expose their vulnerabilities. What do we do? We say, we're not going to cry because if I cry, and I'm using this metaphorically here, if I cry, I'm showing you that I'm weak and I don't want to show you that I'm weak. Because you've hurt me too much. I don't want to show you I'm weak. If I cry, you're going to take advantage of my weakness. That's what we do naturally. But Joseph says the opposite here. He does the opposite. He falls on his brothers and he weeps. And so, in fact, his brothers receive him. And so we say, even brothers and sisters in Christ, we must understand what God is speaking to us about today. Do we understand forgiveness? We made clear in the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, Jesus, uh, Paul making it clear that we are to forgive even as Christ has forgiven us. It is a command of God. To disobey the command is sinful disobedience. And we do not want to sin. Not forgiving is a sin. And Jesus talks about this further in the book of Matthew. I'll give you a couple of verses in the book of Matthew. And I'll show you, now these are verses that you've already you know about, you understand. Let's look at Matthew 18 very quickly first. Now, we picked up on Matthew 18 last week uh, and, and we showed how uh, the man who had owed so much of money um, and now um, does not want to forgive somebody else who owes him far less money. In the book of Matthew last week, we made clear there. Um, and this follows immediately after the matter of church discipline. From verse 15 to verse uh, 18, um, we have the matter of church discipline. And, and, And Peter here being quick to respond from verse 21 says, and Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Good question. And Peter asks the question and he tries to answer it. Up to seven times? Peter thinking, okay, is this the limit? And what does he do? He's quoting from the book of Amos. He's doubling the amount of time. In the book of Amos, three times is mentioned. And here Peter is doubling it, saying, I'm willing to go the extra mile and forgive up to seven times. But, he, but Jesus surprises him here. And Jesus says, I do not say up to seven times, but 70 times seven. As many times as needed, he says. Hold on a moment. Really? Am I to be put through the ringer so many times? Am I to be put through this trial every time? Am I to be put through this horrific situations every time where I need to forgive? That's what Jesus says. That's what Jesus says. Jesus says, I do not say say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. For those of us who are saying, what do I do if it happens again? I cannot give you a thick book manual that tells you what to do. I can direct you to a text. The book of Matthew, the 18th chapter, the 22nd verse says, as many times as is needed, you forgive. Why? Because as many times as is needed for your forgiveness, Christ forgives you and Christ forgives me. And Jesus goes on to, make, to talk about the man here in the story. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wished to settle the accounts of his slaves. And when he, be, when he began to settle them, one of them owed him 10,000 talents. And the 10,000 talents you heard me speak last week was, was uh, 200 
10,000 years of labor, 60 million working days, and in modern money, up to $4.8 billion. Sorry, pounds. 4.8 billion pounds. He cries out to the he cries out to the king. He says in verse 25, but since he did not have the means to pay it, his lord, he commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had to repay him. In verse 26, so the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. He pleaded the mercy. He pleaded for mercy from the king. And what did the king do? The king and the Lord had come had um, and the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released him and gave him and forgave him the debt. The Lord had compassion on him. The king had compassion on him and did what? And forgave him. When he says he forgave him, what did he do? He tore up the debt. He tore up the note. You see, the note is this, my friends. When he took the loan, when he took the money, he signed saying, I will pay you back. He owed. And what did the king do? What did the Lord do? He tore up the note saying, it doesn't exist anymore. Go. Why? Because he had compassion on the man. And that's what Christ has done for us. That is a long note. We owe. We're guilty. What has Christ done? He's tore up the note. What has Christ done? He's paid the price in full. In other words, the note that is owed is the, is, is the note that is brought before the Father. The Father says, you, you've broken the law. You've blasphemed me. You've sinned against me. That's the note. What has Christ done? He's torn it by paying the price with his blood, with his life on Calvary's cross. He's taken the punishment for us. He's torn up the note and said, everything that they deserve, give it to me, Father. He's taken it on your behalf. What did, the, what did the man do in verse 27? Sorry, in verse uh, 28. But the slave went out and found one who was one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And I told you the hundred denarii versus uh, the 10,000 talents, the hundred denarii was, uh, was four months worth of wages and about 6,000 pounds. So 4.8 billion pounds compared to 6,000 pounds is a lot of money. The king forgave him of his 4.8 billion pounds worth of debt, but this slave who was forgiven could not forgive somebody who owed him far less than that. Is this who we are in our own lives? I say it is. I say it is, but look, look at the, 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 the point I want to make to you here concerning, I, I know I made this point clear to you, to you last week, I don't want to go over that again, but look, and one of the points I want to make to you here is that a lack of forgiveness uh, breaks the fellowship with the church. It breaks fellowship with other believers. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. His fellow slaves mean his fellow people, his colleagues, his fellow workers. When they saw what had happened, what did, what, what, what did they see? They saw his unforgiving heart. And what happened? They were grieved by his unforgiving heart. In other words, they, they, they knew the context. Listen, you've been forgiven of this great debt and you can't forgive this man for what he's done? And when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved. So unforgiveness breaks fellowship with other believers. It breaks fellowship with the church. Why? Because the church is reminding you that God has forgiven and you should forgive. It brings disunity in the church when there is a lack of forgiveness. A small point, but an important point nonetheless. What else does unforgiveness do? Go back a few chapters with me in Matthew. Go to the left and go to Matthew chapter 5. And Matthew chapter 5, regarding here the great um, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and in Matthew chapter 5, in, in verses 23 to 24, um, speaking on the matter of murder, but yet it says here, therefore, in verse 23 of chapter 5, therefore, if you are presenting your offering to the altar, uh, uh, sorry, prefer it, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there at the altar, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering, therefore, before the altar, and go first be reconciled to your brother, and, and then come and present your offering. That's, a, that's a, that again, a small point, but an important point. 
When I say small point, I mean it's small in the context of my sermon, but large in, its, in, in what it means to us and the extent of its application. Really, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hindrance in our worship. We're unfit for worship is what Jesus is saying. We're careless in our worship is what Jesus is saying. He's saying if you don't make right with your brother, if you, don't, if you know there's something wrong, if you know there's something wrong, it's within your knowledge, it's within your grasp to know there's something wrong here, I need to put it right. You need to go put it right before you come present your offering. Because if you present your offering and that's not put right, what Jesus is saying, you're, it's an, you're unfit for worship. You're careless in your worship. On the matter of those who need to be forgiven, in the matter of those who you need to forgive, Consider this for a moment. Consider what Jesus is saying. Do not come before the altar with your hands and your heart heavy burdened that it may lead to uh, careless worship. We want to indeed bring careful worship before the Lord. We want, to be, we want to be fit to worship the Lord. We want to do all that is pleasing and right before him. As you hear from this pulpit week after week and those who pray and lead you in the call to worship, in pastoral prayers, that we want to offer our worship that is pleasing and acceptable to God. No amount of singing that we do, as talented as we are in our singing, and we can get the best musicians, and we can get the, the best singers in the church to sing. Our worship is tainted. Our worship is unfit. Our worship is careless. If we have these things hanging over us, that we have not forgiven our brothers, or we have not accepted forgiveness from them, and forgiven them for what they've done. So we find it affects our worship tremendously. I'll give you the last one. Um, let's go further to the back, uh, sorry, further to the left, and go to the book of Psalms and look at Psalm 51. Uh, I will just pick uh, one point from here. Uh, I, I don't want to get caught in preaching an entire sermon from Psalm 51, uh, which is so helpful to us all because it describes each and every one of us. Uh, in Psalm 51, this is uh, David's prayer after he sinned, and uh, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your passion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He recognizes what he's done. But listen to what he says. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. He's recognizing that though I had done this, though I had sent this man, this woman's husband to die at, in the war so that I can take her to be my concubine, I can take her to be the person that I want to sleep with and have a, a sexual intimacy with and, and, and break the law of God. I can commit the sin. I've done two things. I've sent this man to die so that I can take his wife. And in taking his wife, I've also sinned. But he's recognized that all of this is actually sin against God. It's sin against God. God. In the matter here of forgiveness and unforgiveness, we need to recognize that holding back forgiveness, holding back for, if, we're unf if we are being unforgiven, unforgiving, it is God ultimately that we are sinning before. If we are disobedient concerning this, it is God ultimately that we are sinning against. Now, we use this for every sin. For David here, it's adultery. But we can use it for every sin. Ultimately, it's sin against God. We're grieving God. We're hurting God in this. Now, last week, and I want to bring this closer to the end now. Last week, we, we said, okay, um, you know, Pastor, I hear you. I hear what the scripture says. I hear what you're saying. I've got to be obedient to it. I hear what you're talking about. But how can I trust somebody? who's hurt me. And that can be a brother, a sister, a family member, a church member, a pastor, pastor to a congregation member. It is not uncommon for congregants to hurt a pastor. And so pastors may want to stay away from certain people because they're trouble. They're just constantly at his case. They're constantly, well, you know, just there's trouble. And so I don't want to be caught in the case where I need to stay away from you or stay away from those who uh, I ought with. 
I don't want to be guilty of that kind of sin, that kind of behavior in my life. But I could easily make the case, well, I don't trust that person. I can forgive them, but I don't trust that person. And you can say the same, I forgive them, but I don't trust that person. Again, it comes down to us with the Lord. God forgives us. And he trusts us enough that we will come back to him again. He trusts us enough that he will draw near to us. He trusts us enough that he will speak with us. He trusts us enough not to break relationship with us. Yet knowing fully well, brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing fully well that you yourself cannot be trusted. I was speaking to a minister friend of mine last week. We just returned from another part of the world and he traveled with his wife. And he said, I said to him, how wonderful it is to travel with your wife, brother. He said, yes. He's trying to make that happen more often now. He went on a missionary trip. And I said, my desire so much, one of the reasons why I don't take, accept any invitations anywhere, there are many reasons why. One of the reasons why I don't accept ministry invitations anywhere, outside the country, is because I don't want to travel without my wife. My wife works. She's not a, a, a Christian housewife who's not working. She works. So therefore, if I accept invitations, a lot of the time it has to be she has to go without, uh, leave without pay and things like that. But also she's responsible for patients that she takes care of. So it's not just a money matter, it's a care matter and what we're doing for God. By taking care of patients properly, we're honoring God. So if I pull her away from that all the time, I'm pulling her away from the things that she's responsible for to do. But my desire is always to travel with my wife and I don't want to travel without my wife. And here's what I said to the man I, as, as I spoke to him, he's a, he's a brother that I confided in. And I said to him, brother, you know, um, I, I don't want to travel without my wife. And, my, my, and, and, and people around me will say, no, pastor, we trust you to, to travel on your own. And I said, yeah, that's your problem. You trust me too much because I don't trust myself. See, I don't trust, I'm being honest. You see, you're not being honest right now. You, you, you may smile at this, but you're not being honest. I'm being honest with you. I don't trust myself. Do you trust yourself? You shouldn't trust yourself. Because what? You continuously sinning. You're continuously disobeying God. You know that. Let's look at your track record this week. Let's look at your track record last week or the week before that. We can see how much we cannot be trusted. Even in our thoughts, we can't be trusted. There are things that others know about us that we manifest outwardly in our behavior. But there are things in us that we don't tell people about. See, we can't be trusted. We need the help of God. So whenever you look at how, you, well, how whether you're going to trust somebody else, think for yourself how you also cannot be trusted. You need the help of God. You will let people down every day of your life. You will, and we let God down every day of our life. We don't live the way he's called us to live. And so can they be trusted? Yes, as God allows us for them to be trusted. We draw them near to us that we may continue in fellowship together, encouraging one another. Well, what about the fact that if they've done something wrong, if they've done something wrong, uh, we've had this issue this week where, and I, I don't, uh, the, the, the family member we're speaking about, I won't talk about a name right now because it goes out, this thing goes out publicly. The family member we're talking about, the person that you know about in the congregation that, that, that we prayed about this morning, you know, the, the, the matter came up this week that, that prior to the rehab, he was found in Liverpool lying in a car full of drugs completely wiped out, unconscious, whatever the case may be, taken heroin. And the police, somebody reported it to the police. And before the person left Bristol, we told the person, if you drive this car from here, somebody's going to, it's illegal to drive the car, you're under the influence of heroin, and they're going to take your license away. But the person did not listen, they were deep down in their sin, and they didn't want to listen to us, angry with us, went off on this journey. And guess what? The person was called to the police station in Liverpool on Friday. Because somebody said, you're sitting in a car under the influence of drugs. And we're going to take your license away. Taking your license away means you, you, you can't drive anymore. You, someone's going to pick you up. Going to, what are you going to do for work? Now you need to work. What job are you going to get with no license? And here's how we and the de- I, I led the deacons in prayer on, on this on Wednesday night. And here's our prayer. Lord, if it's your will that that person be punished for that crime, 
Lord, we are in that world with you, Lord. We, we agree with that. We want to come alongside that. That the person be punished for the crime that they have committed. You see, it's a crime against the law. The law finds you guilty. Here's the point I'm making. There's some things we can forgive as a church and as a congregation, which we must do. That's our responsibility to do. Now, if the law wants to forgive him, that's the law's choice. Are you with me right now? If the law wants to say, okay, well, listen, we decided we're going to do nothing with this. The law forgives. But let's say the law did not forgive. What do we do then? Let's say you have a family member, a friend, a relative who's committed a crime and they've hurt the family and yet they say, God's really moved on my heart. Will you forgive me? And you say, yes, we forgive you. But the law still has to take its rightful course. Amen. And in the law taking its rightful course, we're going to walk with you through that process. Does it mean you go to prison? Okay. We'll visit you. We'll bring you Bible studies. We'll pray for you. We'll walk with you through that process. That's what Christians do. And so we find that's how we handle the matter of trust here with those who we forgive. There are multiple other texts that we can go to, but I want to bring this to a close today by saying, do I understand forgiveness? I do hope and pray today. Even as I've unfolded my own heart before you today, that you would indeed have learned something from these two sermons and learned something from the examples and the illustrations that we brought before you today. And that you would say, by the end of the benediction today, I understand a little more about forgiveness. Let's pray. Our Father in God, we are so much in need of your help. These sermons quieten our hearts and cause us to listen. Thank you, Lord, for being patient with us. Every one of us deserves uh, nothing that you've given us. We all, Lord, can't be trusted. We all fall. Your, t- you, you, your scripture makes clear to us that we all fall short of your glory. We're all in need of your help. We know in our own lives as we look in the mirror, which is your word, we recognize how we can't be trusted, Lord. Help us with that, we pray. Help us in this forgiveness, Lord, that we may be able to trust others. And indeed, Lord, as you have been hurt so many times and you continue to be hurt, who are we, Lord, to say that we are above you and our standard is above you? Help us, we pray. Forgive us of our arrogance and our ignorance. Help us, Lord, as we raise our children in the home to teach them about forgiveness, Lord. Help us to understand that so we can teach them from our understanding. Help us to understand the theology of forgiveness so that we may indeed be good examples to them in teaching them about forgiveness. A husband and a wife, Lord, who argue, who fight in the home and the children are learning. Lord, teach the husband and the wife about about forgiveness, Lord. Brothers to brothers, Lord, and sisters to sisters who fight with each other and argue over things, Lord. One not prepared to forgive the other. Oh, Lord, our God, will you cut at their hearts, Lord, and show the forgiveness of your son, Jesus Christ. Or for those who will continue to push people away and not love them anymore because of the hurt they've done, though they're forgiven. Lord, help even those this morning. Help me this morning. Help my family this morning. Help our congregation this morning. Father, we pray. Do the supernatural work. Lord, I've... I've I've opened your word as you've instructed me, Lord. I've brought it to the attention of your people and my own family. As we bring it, Lord, to the one more time here on the Lord's Day morning, Lord, would you, Father God, help us, we pray. Help us. Help us. We want nothing to hinder our worship, Lord. We want to be obedient to your holy text. Lord, we can sing and pray as much as we can, but if, Lord, it be hindered, Lord, by our own unforgiveness and our own attitude concerning forgiveness, Oh, Lord, it is a careless worship before you. Help us, we pray, that we may bring a careful worship to you. We ask this mercy, Lord. My prayers fall short of how we need to pray. My prayers fall short of how much we need to fall on our knees and cry out to you, Lord, and that you may have mercy upon us for our attitude concerning this. Father, we pray, see what I cannot say today. See what I have not said today. See our hearts, Lord, and help us. We ask for the help of the Spirit. We ask you, Lord, 
to draw us near. Draw us near, Lord, even as we come to the table of the Lord this morning, your table, your table tells us, Lord, if we, if we would confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What a promise, Lord, to us. It's a comfort that we have. Help us, Lord, not to take forgiveness from you, but yet not, not, not forgive others. You have forgiven us such a great debt, Lord. How are we not to forgive others their debts? Father God, we pray, help us to tear up the note. For somebody here today, Lord, as I bring this sermon to an end for this season, if there be somebody, Lord, in this congregation that you're ministering to, Lord, show them how they can tear up the note, tear up the paper, tear up the debt. Tear it up, Lord, because it is doing them more harm than anything else, Lord. It is harming their own soul, Lord. By withholding, Lord, as it once said, Lord, we're withholding love and forgiveness from somebody else and we're drinking poison, our own poison. It's, hard, it's hurting us more than anybody else. And so, Lord, we do pray today, help us. Help us, Lord, that we may be free, Lord, in our hearts and our souls, free and free indeed, Lord. Your word sets us free. You set us free. The truth of this, Lord, indeed, sets us free in Christ Jesus. Oh, Lord, our God, help someone here today to tear up that note and to forgive and to draw that, that person nearer to them, to fall, on their, to fall on their neck, to throw their arms around them and say how much we miss them. That somebody, Lord, today in this congregation, who in that relationship with somebody across the world maybe, who's heard the sermon today, Lord, and cut at the heart, show them how they can pick up the phone, Lord, and start a conversation again. And to throw themselves around that person's arms across the phone. And to weep on their shoulders even. Oh Lord, to say how much they miss them. And want to be with them. Father God, we pray. Do this work upon our hearts, Lord. Recognizing how you draw us near to you. That today you've made the call to us. Today, Lord, you've picked up the phone and called us today. You've called us through the sermon. You've called us through the prayers. And Lord, you've thrown your arms around us today. And drawn us to you. Oh, Lord, thank you today. Thank you for showing us. Thank you for showing us, Joseph, as the typology and the picture of you, our Lord. We've learned so much today. Thank you for our journey, Lord. And we want to continue learning. Help us to talk about this over our dinner time today and our family time today. As families gather one with another, that we may speak of this, Lord, on this Lord's Day. In, our acts of, in, the, in the acts of private and public devotion today, that we may speak of this today much, Lord. And recognize your great love for us and your great forgiveness of our souls. For this we pray. For this we trust. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.